Welcome, once again, to Maester Monthly, your favorite pseudo-monthly podcast hosted by the moderators of the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit. My name is Michael, also known as Bookshelf Stud. And I am Eliana, and you may know me as Glass Table Girl. And I'm Matt, also known as Joe Magician. And I am Jen, known as Bassmaster. That's right, today we are, we are joined by the first of many special guests in this podcast. You guys are in for quite a treat. Before we jump into the subreddit highlights and talking about our favorite posts from the last month or so, I want to ask you guys a quick question. If you could steal a piece of bling from any character in the Song of Ice and Fire canon, doesn't have to be the main series, what would you steal from them? Be it a crown, a sword, a purple hairnet, whatever it is. Eliana, what would you steal? Well, speaking of purple hairnets, I would actually either steal Sansa's quote-unquote amethyst purple hairnet or Mm. Melisandre's ruby necklace slash choker because both of those (laughs) seem like very fashionable items. Mm. Chokers are back in, the 90s are back, (laughs) but also, I don't know, a purple hairnet just seems really (laughs) swanky and cool and I don't wear stone, precious stone hairnets right now, but I could definitely be the kind of person who does. (laughs) (laughs) Are you worried that you might accidentally kill your friends though? Like if one just drops off into a drink while you're out partying? All of a sudden, you killed somebody? Because wearing the purple hairnet, I totally slay. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) This is true. Eliana the Slayer. Yeah, that's your fabled nickname. That'd be a good one. Matt, what what piece of bling would you want in your possession? I'm torn about this one. I really like Rob's pointy crown. That things look like it would be awesome to just wear around town. Mm. Really show off that I'm the king of the north. But it's not very <laughs> practical. So I'm also thinking about Euron's Valyrian steel chainmail that we see from the Winds of Winter chapter. Because that's practical. I can protect it at all times. Yeah, it's very practical. <laughs> it's light. I'm safe from sword attacks or anything else. And I look cool. Where do you live that you have to worry about sword attacks? <laughs> There's a lot of bears around here. Where do you live that you don't? <laughs> wow. Do you think Valyrian steel is bulletproof, Matt? Well, it depends if the uh, if the bolts are made out of Valyrian steel. Oh, now that's a good question. Can Valyrian mm. steel cut Valyrian steel? I don't know, mm. but I don't want to find out while I'm wearing my armor. You got to test that stuff on the side. That's yeah, good point. And it won't protect you from a broken heart. Go on. <gasps> oh, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, so, so Jen, what would you steal? What would your thing be? I am kind of partial, probably to the armor corset thing that Cersei wore during the um in the second season during the battle for Blackwater Bay just because reasons uh, yeah. I guess it's also mm. practical now that I think about it. it it does seem kind of practical just like Matt yeah yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> armor who knew it'd be coming back you never know you never know <laughs> better safe than sorry yeah mm-hmm. and fashion statement Oh, yeah, yeah. Fashion statement. You would definitely be the only person at the party with that dress. Uh, I gotta say, if I had to pick something, there's a lot of good, like, helmets and hats in this series. I'm tempted to go with, like, Gregor Clegane's little fist helmet, um, which is one of my favorite pieces of bling. But I think what I would actually go with is the Archmaester Marwyn's rod, rask, mask, and ring of Valyrian steel, mm. his maced, Archmaesterly mm-hmm. guard. Set. It's a set. Yeah, a set, exactly. I feel like for Halloween, for masquerade parties. That's true. If you ever go to Venice, you're set. Ex- exactly. That's exactly what I'm thinking. I go to Venice, I have my mask, my, <laughs> my rod, and my ring. And uh, man, yeah, I'd, I'd be set for life, basically. Um, I mean, you don't even have to like wait till Halloween. You can just mix and match, wear it in your everyday life. Who knows when you'll need a rod? You can wear the ring, like a class ring. That's true. <laughs> and who knows when you'll need a rod? You could also be a superhero. Oh, mm. uh, yeah. I could put my mask on and... Nobody cared who I was before I put on the Valyrian steel mask. Yeah. We'd like to take some time to look at our favorite posts from the last month or so. The hottest topics, the nicest catches, the greatest discussions. I wanted to highlight one. User Wild2098. This post was from back in March, March 24th. And it's just called The Young Wolf and the Hound, about a hypothetical, where Wild2098 asks... 
It got me thinking about the Hound changing allegiance and serving under Rob. Could you imagine what a great pickup that would have been for him? I'm sure there would have been some heated debate if they could trust him or what to do with him, but I think Rob would decide to keep him, the Hound, close. What do you guys think? Would Rob take him in his service, etc.? And there was a lot of really good discussion in this thread about this hypothetical of the Hound potentially making it to River Run with Arya, depositing Arya, and maybe teaming up with Rob, and maybe entering his service. So I'm curious what you guys thought about this. I love hypotheticals about the, the series. What does Rob know about Sandor? Like, what has he heard about him? I feel like the Hound's reputation is just as sort of Joffrey Baratheon's loyal man. So if he showed up, that'd probably be Rob's first thought, right? It's like, oh, look, it's Joffrey's dog. Because he would have met him at Winterfell, Yeah. right? I mean, the Hound was at Winterfell. And more importantly, the other lords in Rob's retinue would know that about Sandor. Even him joining the army would be a big problem Mm because they might think he's a spy. They might think he's going to turn traitor on them, that he's on like some sort of secret mission. I mean, after he left this, he left the Kingsguard. That's... Yeah. They're not, they're not going to forget that. And even if Rob thinks it's a good idea, it's unclear if the people around him would either ac- accept Sandor into any kind of notable position. Like, he says he wants to be made a lordling. I'm not sure that would happen. And then from that, Catelyn, she went to King's Landing, so Ned probably told her about the whole thing that happened on the way, and mm-hmm. she's now with Rob, mm-hmm. and that's going to color his opinion of the Hound, because she has that. So if he's showing up with Arya, and it was literally mm. Arya's friend who killed, she could vouch for him, and then it becomes a matter of how much trust do they put in a little girl, but right. she's a little girl who's been through a lot and obviously has her family's best interests at heart. Like, even in the first book, when she overhears that conversation with Varys and Illyrio, and Ned's like, oh, yeah, whatever. You, you don't know what you're talking about. Maybe they would just look at it like that. Like, oh, Arya, you, you don't really know what you're talking about. You're just, you're all messed up in the head from, from your crazy adventure. Um, we can't trust you. <laughs> your wacky times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they'd be like, she has Stockholm Syndrome. Right. Which is what they called it in Westeros. Uh, th- I think there is a way this could work, though. If they accepted Sandor, they'd probably just put him in, like, with the general soldiers. Obviously, he's a huge man. He's a very good fighter. He could earn his way up Mm. through the battles. They keep throwing him out on the front line. He keeps surviving. Becomes like a rallying point as he tells people how awful Joffrey is and how terrible the Lannisters are. He could be... Right. I I think it'd be a good political move to bring him in, but make him earn his position. Would have been a contrast to, I guess, like John's story with the Wildlings as opposed to John, who is like, I'm still a Night's Watchman at heart. Um, Sandor Clegane would be someone who's trying to earn the trust yeah. of his enemy in earnest. It's kind of funny to think about that as, obviously, John takes the oaths of the Night's Watch, Sandor takes the oaths of the Kingsguard, and there are these two institutions, white cloaks and black cloaks, that are sworn to take their vows of celibacy or whatever. That could set up later, like when Jamie struggles with the whole oath that he's taken. Mm. Like, it could just set up an, at a mm. reference point where it's like, oh, well, you know, the Hound, like, has forgotten his oaths and why did he do that Mm. there's also a a really good point further down the thread from uh user tim the enchanter yeah where he's talking about let's say that sandor somehow finds his way where he can advise rob either indirectly or directly Uh uh-huh his bluntness and his very accurate way of reading situations would be very very useful and like catalan in uh in a lot of her advice sometimes frames it as like you should do this or is still trying to teach Rob, Sandor would just be very blunt about it. Like, this is a terrible idea. You're going to get a lot of people killed. Or you can't trust these people, that kind of thing. I think it would be, he would probably be a very useful advisor if he was ever given a chance. Would the Red Wedding have happened if he had him as an advisor? Oh, man. Probably. (laughs) Would there have been some differences in the way it happened? Like, would the Hound try to have saved Rob and because protect the king? And I wonder if Walder wouldn't have rethought his position because all of a sudden Arya's back on the table and she was supposed to marry a Frey. She shows up at the Red Wedding and Cat and Rob are like, look, Walder, we can make the deal worth it again. We can regain some of your trust. He probably still would have carried it out, but I remember one thing during the Red Wedding is they made all the soldiers hang up their swords and their weapons and stuff like that because it's like, oh, we're at a wedding. Mm. I can't see Sandor Clegane ever giving up his sword, no matter what. True. No. There yeah. would be at least one Stark Bannerman 
able to kill some people. That's a good point. Assuming he even made it in the feast hall. I mean, a lot of people were left outside in the tents. So maybe Sandor would have just run away from the burning tents again because... That's true. That could have just happened. uh, Oh, yeah. So in other words, this is just a story about Sandor continually running away from things that are on fire. (laughs) Um, Really doesn't like fire. (laughs) My take personally was that it would have ended up with Sandor and Victarion fighting in the mud outside of Moat Kaelin. Ooh, um, that's a battle that's, I want to uh, see. You know. Sounds like a fantasy. Yeah, right? <laughs> right? Are they are they wearing armor? Or are they just sort of tussling around in the mud? I, I was picturing them in armor, but now I'm not. The Hound and the Squid. <laughs> so the next celebrated highlight we have comes from user Tyrion T. Lannister 2, the order in which Danny's dragons will die. In this post, they... They lay out that they believe by the end of the series, all three of Danny's dragons are going to die in some fashion. And they try to use context clues from the story and the way Danny thinks about them, especially after she thinks about how dragons can be slayed. And sort of looking at their names and kind of what their behaviors are and seeing if you can predict which order they will die in and how. Pointing out the order of the visions of the deaths in Danny's visions, it is curious because you, first it's Viserys dying and then it's Rago dying and then Rhaegar dying. I had I'd never seen that take before, and I think it's a really smart one. I think you can also look at where they are at the end of the Dance of Dragons and where we know they are at the beginning of the Winds of Winter, and try and apply the ideas in this to what's physically happening to them. So Drogon's right, okay. off with Danny, so she's <laughs> Drogon's definitely not going to die. He's off in the Dothraki Sea, but. Uh, Viserion and Rhaegal are in the Battle of Fire. Uh, yeah. Rhaegal is f- circling the Ironborn ships. Victarion's down there with a dragon binder. Imagine how poorly Victarion would treat, treat a dragon if he got it. If he gets control of Rhaegal, he doesn't know anything about them biologically. He doesn't know anything about how to use them, how to protect them. Yeah. That If he gets control of it, Rhaegal might be dead real fast. And then uh, Viserion, he's circling around Marine while they're flinging in, uh, the corpses in. He's in range of the Yunkish siege weapons, and actually they point out that they should be shooting at them, but they keep shooting at their regular soldiers instead, which seems kind of foolish. But he's also catching corpse. Yeah. Corpses, the the, the plague corpses as they're flying through the air. Yeah. Can dragons catch plagues? Maybe he's going to get sick? Oh, that's a good question. Can dragons get get diseases, get get sick? Do you think he has, like, mind, can they? Who knows? Seasonal allergies too. I mean, that's, that's pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> oh no, there's ra- there's ragweed. Drogon's is having a terrible time. <laughs> he accidentally sets like an entire town on fire because he sneezed too hard. <laughs> um, Tyrion T. Lannister did in a comment. They had some ideas about how the dragons are going to die. Mm. I thought they were all at least fun, if not necessarily going to happen. Like the idea that Rhaegal will be killed by Robert Strong on the Trident as this sort of mirror of Robert Baratheon killing Rhaegar, mm. Ty- Rhaegar Targaryen on the Trident. And then the idea that Viserion will be killed by Drogon, just like Viserys was killed by Drogo. Um, mm. <laughs> which I... That one that one I buy more than the Robert Strong thing. Um, because I think at, at some point in the series, dragons are going to be set against each other. I mean, True. I, yeah. I feel like that's not a yeah. controversial prediction. Um, so for Viserion to be killed by Drogon, I think is... I, there's at least more there to back it up than than other combinations, I think. It, it always seemed to me kind of obvious that the dragon that I guess would, if swayed against Danny, would be Viserion, just because of A, his mm. namesake. B, you see him like mm-hmm. ex- showing a lot of affection towards Brown Ben Plum, who also turned right. against Danny, and I don't know that he would like. That- it's true. I go back and forth between whether Plum will ride a dragon or not, but like at. Plum is aligned with Tyrion, and people say see Tyrion as being someone who will ride a dragon. So, could it be possible that Viserion ends up with Aegon through Brown Ben Plum? Like, could Brown Ben Plum turn again? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's that's true. Like, takes like, a dragon and sells it to the highest bidder. No yeah, one would right. pay more than yeah, Illyrio. Nobody would pay more than right. somebody who needs a dragon to prove their yeah. claim to the throne. But then there's also, there's fun stories about uh, people trying to be dragon riders and getting mauled or eaten. It's not just being a Valyrian. There's plenty of Valyrian ancestry people throughout the story that have tried this and just instantly bit it because the dragon didn't accept them. Like Quentin. Yep. Like Quentin. <laughs> uh, On fire and dead. Very dead. Yeah. We have it established in the uh, novellas that with uh, nettles that one not 
necessarily need be Valyrian. Like mm. we don't nece- we don't know that Nettles is Valyrian, and Brown Ben Plum has enough. <laughs> A drop of dragon's blood, maybe. A drop or two. There's also some uh, some sweet tinfoil that goes with this uh, this idea, where if you think that the names are maybe some sort of blood blood magic thing that these that the dragons are inhabited by the people they're named after, like Drogos and Drogon, Viserys and Viserion, Rhaegar and Rhaegal somehow. And if yeah. you and if you take those personalities, yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. Where you said like Viser- Viserys did not like Danny. Well, if it's actually him, he's really not going to like Danny eventually. This all goes back to our discussions of are the dragons Evangelion? Who knows? Yes. Yeah. It's, <laughs> are, is it that's Neon an Genesis comparison. Evangelion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah are they avas it could it could very well be we don't really know what happened on that pyre and what caused those dragons to hatch george hasn't explained it nobody knows there was actually an interesting post about chemistry where somebody huh. argued it was the contents of the fire that made it light but if that's true you'd think it would be somebody would have figured that out earlier so there's some magic going right, on it was like gunpowder yeah and considering how much george likes talking about the dead rising again could be true <laughs> Another post that we wanted to highlight, still fairly fresh, and it was posted by Bastard Brave on uh, April 13th. And it's just a nice catch about more proof for the case that Olena was responsible for Joffrey's death. Bastard Brave compares the wedding cloaks in the two wedding ceremonies, Joffrey's wedding ceremony and Tommen's wedding ceremony. In Joffrey's wedding ceremony to Marjorie, he uses his mother's cloak of House Lannister, the crimson and gold. In Tommen's ceremony, Lady Olena argues against using the Lannister one. She's like, oh no, we, we can't use that. It looks threadbare. Wouldn't a stag be more fitting? Bastard Brave points out that, of course, Olena didn't care what cloak Joffrey and Marjorie got married with because she knew Joffrey was going to die. She wasn't worried in the symbolism of the marriage of the ceremony or anything like that. But when it came to Tommen, who she's interested in keeping alive, they need to preserve this alliance. She's much more interested in the actual details and symbolism of the marriage ceremony. User Sheepalk says that it's along with it being Elena paying attention to the details and wanting to establish the legitimacy of this marriage to a Baratheon. She also sees it as kind of like Elena sort of rubbing in Cersei's face the incest and the infidelities and just kind of like yeah mm. and how she calls Tom and King Robert's true born son and she's just kind of like <laughs> using this as a way to to insult Cersei in an underhanded way exactly if she's calling Tom and the true born that's implying that Joffrey isn't <laughs> kind of a slap across the face to her in public yeah it's got, and it's definitely her like winking at Cersei and being like doesn't this look better for his true-born son, right? Am I right? We, we know what we're talking about. <laughs> There's also a good point that this is after Tywin's died. Mm-hmm. So that Elena probably feels way more comfortable pushing around Cersei and doing what she wants in court. Because Tywin was her main rival. She doesn't see Cersei that way. She yeah, sees that's her true. as somebody she can control and manipulate because she has in the past. Yeah. And continues to, yeah. This is the marriage that she actually cares about. Joffrey's marriage was not going to last ever since... I think the first Sansa chapter in the Storm of Swords, when she meets with Sansa and and Sansa tells him that Joffrey's a monster. I feel like Olena sort of yeah, knew from that true. point. She was like, okay, you know what? This Joffrey thing, we're not going to let it go beyond like a few days after the wedding. We're going to take care of him and then get Tommen. So I, I, I feel like she had sort of written it off at that point. Uh, there's also evidence of this nice catch going forwards. After Tommen gets married, Olena and Marjorie and Loras try very hard to sway Tommen into thinking about uh, Robert more and not thinking mm. of himself as much of a Lannister as more mm. Baratheon king. Right. And yeah. like Loris uh, offers to start training him in combat. Marjorie tries to head off Cersei at just about every pass she can, yeah. uh, become a voice in, her, in his ear more than his mother is. And this is a small example of the larger Tyrell plan post-wedding that they all seem on board with. Honestly, they're doing Cersei's work for her because she should be focused on <laughs> propping up Tommen's legitimacy. Like she, yeah, she should absolutely be focused on these, yeah. these optics of like, no, he's he's a real Baratheon. I mean, they're they're doing her a favor here. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Every time she drapes Tommen in crimson and gold, it's going to remind people of Lannister, which that's not his father. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. That's not where, not where he gets legitimacy from. 
user Bennings463 in this thread. I'm just going to read it aloud because it's hilarious. It's got, he goes, I've got the image of everybody trying to kill him, I'm referring to Joffrey, in over-the-top comical ways, all of which are foiled by a separate attack from someone else. E.g., <laughs> Garland launches an anvil at his head while Balin Swan tries to strangle him, but the anvil whacks Swan on the head instead, causing him to slam into Joffrey's back. Joffrey coughs out the poison pie, which splats into <laughs> the arrow fired at him by Oswald Kettle Black, so that it bounces around the room until it slices through the hand of Oberyn Martell, causing him to drop his spear and spill wine. All over the floor, Olenna then slips on the wine and drops her poison chalice, the dog sent after Joffrey, by Boris Bond, obviously a faceless man, then stop to lap up the wine and die from the poison, etc. I wish he had written that instead. <laughs> I love it. And the next comment by Charlie Problems is, one might ask why this alternative was rejected by George R. R. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Seriously, didn't George R. R. Martin write the, sh- the Purple Wedding for the show? He had a second chance to get it right. With the, yeah. Uh... yeah, he did. If it wasn't Olena, he probably should have corrected it in the show. <laughs> <laughs> he should have made it the Looney Tunes of Westeros. <laughs> And Joffrey's Roadrunner. Like Sir Dantos just has a big hammer and he's like trying to yeah. bomb <laughs> Joffrey on the head. It could be like a Monty Python skit. <laughs> and for our last celebrity ha- highlight, we have a post from the Day's King titled Jon Snow's Mentors, Father Figures, and Influences. In this post, as the title says, they break down all the huge list of very impressive people, large and small, who have influenced Jon and sort of details what they've done through them. You go through, you get, obviously, you start with Ned Stark, then you move yeah. to Tyrion Lannister, Benjamin Stark, Donal Noy, the blacksmith from Castle Black, Maester Aemon, J.R. <laughs> Mormont, Corrin Halfhand, Vance Raider, Stannis Baratheon. Yeah. The last one he says is Rhaegar, which is, never met Rhaegar, kind of a, maybe like a genetic thing going on there. But I, I, I've never really seen all these characters and how John changes after meeting them laid out like this. And there's a lot of really good insights in here, especially Donal Noy, which is sort of a passing character. He has a, a really badass moment where he dies defending the, uh, the tunnel, but yeah. you forget, I, I think a lot of people forget that John takes his quarters as his Lord commanders. Right. He refuses to go into J.R. Mormons and the example that Donal Noy shows him really influences him going forward. It really breaks down all of the guiding figures that John encounters on his hero's journey. And yeah, it does start with his quote-unquote father, Ned Stark, and then ends with his probably real father, Rhaegar Targaryen. That was an interesting thing to include, because obviously, yeah, John not only has no idea that he could be related to Rhaegar, but has never thought about Rhaegar. Like, like he's not even like, right. oh, I, w- I wish I could have met that guy. He seems like a cool guy. I mean, like, he never thinks about him. The poster makes a lot of good points connecting John to Rhaegar. His somber, brooding nature is just like mm. his real father. Rhaegar drew in friends and brought out the best in these people, and John does that too. And I would say that John and Rhaegar both had a tendency to do what they thought was right without really giving two hoots and a holler about maybe what effect that would have on a larger scale, whether that's abducting Lyanna or letting the wildlings through the wall or whatever. Well, it's less not caring. It's just that prioritize, prioritizing the larger concerns over the smaller ones. Yeah, and even beyond just things such as kidnapping Lyanna, the idea that Rhaegar would potentially, as shown by the world of Ice and Fire, start a war or like go against his own family and his father because he sees it as the right thing to do, even though it's going against tradition. And Jon Snow is also going against tradition. And it is interesting to wonder if like that is an inherited aspect, his character, because as Michael said, in all five of the books, John only thinks about Rhaegar once in a Game of Thrones, and it's only when they're talking about how Donald Noy forged Robert's Warhammer that killed Rhaegar Targaryen. So uh. he's just not a presence. But I think that the Day's King does make an interesting point in the comments later when he says that like it's not necessarily that Rhaegar would be an influence now, but should John find out that Rhaegar is his father, obviously that's going to be someone who wants to learn more about definitely and start to understand him and maybe pattern some of himself on him. I mean, I've seen a great theory from, uh, I think it was poor Quentin where I saw it first. John, upon finding out his parentage near Winterfell or something like that, will actually try and go to the Tower of Joy, like try and go as far south as possible to come to this place where 
his mother died and where he was born and all that, um, chasing down his, his past. So I, I like the idea that John, on finding out his parentage, is really going to push more to learn more about Lyanna and Rhaegar. There was another really good comment down in the thread from Beastmaster95. Good name. Yeah, great name. Um, who pointed out this post made them realize that John really has no strong mother figures at all. There's Catelyn, sort of, but she's not really a mother to him, and in fact is conspicuously not a mother to I mean, is specifically not his mother. So he really doesn't have any mother figures in the series. And so they ask, do you think he'll ever sort of have a mom in the series? Which I, I doubt it. I don't think so. But yeah, you can kind of see that in um, how strongly he latches on to Egret, like the first non-family woman who shows him any affection, and he is all in on her. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, he's like willing to give up the Night's Watch because he finally found uh, somebody that will that loves him totally, and that really yeah. that's that's the large draw of Egret, I think, is in a weird way how much Catelyn didn't like him. Yeah, that's a powerful take on on this this poor. Especially bastard. because they're both redheads. <laughs> Just looking at the list of characters that John has interacted with and how they've influenced him. Just going from top to the bottom, we have. The Lord of Winterfell, we have Tyrion Lannister, one of the smartest characters in the story. Benjamin Stark, first ranger of the Night's Watch. Don't know why, who doesn't really have an impressive title, but is an impressive person. Maester Aemon, who could have been king and one of the most learned men in the kingdoms. J.R. Mormont, who gave up his lordship and his sword yeah. to what appears to be a larger goal. Corrin Halfhand, one of the best rangers yeah, in the right. Night's Watch. Mance Raider, king beyond the wall. Stannis Baratheon, another king. And then Rhaegar, who could have been king. If you, just looking at this list, it seems pretty obvious that George is setting up John to be royalty at some point, mm. and to be a very and just I, I can't think of another character who has this many impressive mm. people that he meets and influences him. Especially given that he's like yeah. all the way at the at the crap end of the world. I mean, he's yeah. he's up at the wall, and somehow manages to intersect with all these really important people. Eliana, earlier you pointed out that Donal Noy forged the hammer that killed Rhaegar, or, or you mentioned that, and I never put that together, but that's really cool that John meets the guy who made the weapon that killed his father. Like That's that's such a fantasy protagonist kind of thing to, to have happen to you. This is just the most impressive education any character has gotten in this story. Yeah, and I mean, that's a theme that goes in John's character, like, from the beginning when he's like, ah, oh, why am I a steward? Why am I just waiting on the Lord Commander? And then Sam's like, don't you <laughs> see? He's grooming you. He's going to have you learn from him because your entire life is an education because he wants you to eventually become a leader in the Night's Watch. You're destined for great things, John. It's in the plot. You have plot armor, literally. <laughs> <laughs> exactly like that. Haven't you read other fantasy books? This is where you're going. <laughs> I feel like this post makes a pretty good implicit argument for John surviving to the end of the series. If I were creating a character who I wanted to, at the end of my series, become king and rule and make complicated choices, I would totally give him this like catalog of these motley ministers who have sort of trained him throughout the years. Because I think it sets him up to be such an interesting king character. And he'll always be going, oh, what would, what would Ned have said? What would Tyrion have said? What would, what would Donal Noy have said? What would Mance say? And then he has the experience of, like, he doesn't just have the hindsight of what would they do. He has the hindsight of what should I do that they didn't. He doesn't have to make the same mistakes as them. He can actually right. uh, survive. Mm -hmm even though he, like, died first, but survived till the end of the series. <laughs> He's coming back. It's fine, we know. It's canon. In spite of all of these great mentors that John has had, did he learn enough? Did he actually learn from these people successfully? Or did this impressive catalog of mentors just lead him to make some really stupid decisions and get himself killed uh, for no good reason? We'll find out on the unpopular opinion, Thunderdome. <laughs> Joining us this time is fellow mod, Fat Walda. Hey guys, uh, my name's Walda. You might know me from such posts as uh, the Size Perception and Tormund's member in Westeros. Oh, <laughs> man. Such great stuff. Yeah, that, that really put us on the map. 
the unpopular opinion that's competing in the Thunderdome today. Did Jon Snow sort of have it coming at the end of A Dance with Dragons? Did he pave the way to his own death? So where does everyone stand on this? I mean, what, what, how do you feel about Jon in Dance with Dragons? And Bowen Marsh trying to tell him not to do things and holding him back. Was he right? And I would argue yes. Um, I think some people might disagree with me. Uh, so I agree with you, Michael. <laughs> I think that John, while he's very smart, he's great at thinking into the future and like what he wants the Night's Watch to be able to accomplish in terms of standing up against the others. Yes. Um, and his heart is definitely in the right place because he sees the wildlings as people. I think that he was not as effective a leader and Lord Commander of the Night's Watch as he could have been. And because of this, he created rifts between him and the people that he meant to lead. And mm-hmm. that led to them feeling like, damn, we can't put up with this anymore at the end of A Dance with Dragons. And they're like, we... Damn. This is this is ridiculous. We must stab him and get rid of him. <laughs> Just like in Julius Caesar. That's right. Oh, ah! The That's historical right. references. Oh my god! <laughs> So good. Just like a Caesar salad or a BLT. (laughs) That's our next Thunderdome, everyone. Um, Our next Thunderdome, to give you a preview, is is the BLT essentially a salad? (laughs) Moving on back to itself. (laughs) So yeah, Matt, I I think just from from what I know about you, I feel like you might disagree (laughs) with the idea that uh, John kind of had it coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to go ahead and disagree entirely with just about everything Eliana said. And her mouth is full of BLT, so she can't argue. Even about the BLTs? <laughs> Especially about the BLTs. It's my position that Bowen Marsh never really gave John a chance, and he was a terrible subordinate who, from the time that John chops out Janoslin's head, is plotting revenge on John and uses all these mm. things as fuel to make a mutiny happen, which he ends up leading. So he stabs those daggers in John's stomach. Ugh. I would add that, that John's argument wasn't just a humanitarian one. He's not just advocating for bringing the wildlings through the wall because they are people, because they are men that the Night's Watch has sworn to protect. He's also pointing out that live wildlings on our side of the wall means not dead wildlings on the other side of the wall for the others to reanimate and fight against us. And consistently Bowen Marsh is ignoring the threat of these potential others and whites invasion um, to the point where when they go out to swear in new recruits at the Godswood, they find an encampment of wildling refugees. John brings them back along with the bodies. And at the time, the men he's with are like, why are you bringing the bodies back? And he's like, I got a plan. And he brings them back and he puts them (laughs) in the ice cells because he wants to study them. He wants to see, are these guys going to reanimate, you know, like the other two that we brought back that then tried to attack Mormont. And Bowen Marsh comes in the next day and he's like, why did you bring these wildlings back and lock them in the ice cells? That's dumb. And John's like, because the others are our enemy and we need to know more about our enemy. And Bowen Marsh is just completely lost on him. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a failure of John's to communicate, though. I, I think John just sort of walks into these situations assuming that people are going to trust him because he's a fantasy protagonist and he kind of knows it. Like, <laughs> Is he that self-aware? I mean, I don't know. Like, he's he's got the magic sword. He's, you know, the scion of, uh, of an ancient line of kings. The Starks, I mean, and the Targaryens, but he doesn't know that one. I think there's a certain amount of, of uh, like, arrogance in John where he where he's just like, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. You said your random stuff about the wildlings. We can't trust them, uh, but I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I, I don't really need to listen to that. And, of course, I mean, we we as the reader know that he is, like, he's he's correct. He's, he's making the right set of choices, but I think he could have done more to win over Bowen Marsh, to be a better leader, not be such a stuck-up guy. I'm going to go ahead and disagree with that, because John gives Bowen... And uh, the people he's representing, ample time to make their arguments. He's not telling Bowen and them to basically get out. He's not, like, stonewalling them. He has lots of conversation with these guys. He hears them out. The first time we see it is uh, on top of the wall, I think, 
Bowen has almost a page of dialogue where he's laying out his opinion for John and what he wants to do. And John says to him, I value your opinion. I'll think about this. I promise. And he ends up rejecting it, but that doesn't, but Bowen keeps going and he keeps pushing the argument, even though John has said no and told him why no. It's not that like John's just handing down just flat no orders. He's giving him reasons. Bowen's not adapting to them. He's not reaching out. And at a certain Mm. point, isn't it on Bowen to not try and understand his Lord Commander along with John to understand him? And we see from John's dialogue, he does understand Bowen and he tells him so. I've been rereading the John chapters from Dance with Dragons for another essay. And it's every single John chapter. Bowen's like... Dude, yeah. why are you doing this? And John's like, because the wildlings are people and we don't want to fight them as whites. And Bowen's like, okay, that's dumb. Like every single chapter. So I feel like I feel John's frustration at constantly having to explain this to Bowen Marsh. I am not John's biggest mm. fan. Okay. I am. Yeah. I love John. I think that John is entitled. I wouldn't say arrogant necessarily because he has this undercurrent of I'm not worthy because I'm a bastard. Uh, But there's also the resentment of, but why am I not worthy because I'm a bastard? And he's in this organization. The Night's Watch is purportedly egalitarian. You come and you swear your oath and you take the black and everybody is brothers and everybody is equal. And yet Bowen Marsh is trying to give favor to people who are lords. Well, this is traditionally how we do it. And he's being a very bad subordinate he's supposed to be an example for the men and he's continually questioning their leader and saying well the men aren't going to go for that and it's like well you know what bowen if you would step up and back john up maybe they would Uh, go for it yeah and also bowen's doing it directly in front of the men that's a no-no you don't you don't disagree with the commander in front of everybody you do it in private that's the respectful thing to do bowen's getting worse and at one point in front mm. of the men, he, he says John's acting treasonous in front of everybody. That's crazy. Bowen can't do that. Well, is it not established in the Night's Watch that that's the sort of culture that they have? Because in previous chapters, I mean, granted, yes, John beheads Jano Slint, but he would talk back at Alistair Thorne. Because the Night's Watch is meant to be a little more egalitarian, wouldn't it make sense for someone who is mm. such as Bowen Marsh, who actually... As opposed to like when we compare it to the prologue of a Game of Thrones, Bowen Marsh, in many ways, outranks John in terms of seniority, but not in terms of title. John's is Lord Commander, oh. but Bowen Marsh has been on the Night's Watch for much longer. He himself has had to fight the Wildlings, which is where his point of view comes in, and he has been running the Night's Watch and has been taking care of it for maybe even longer than John's been alive. That's a really interesting comparison, actually, to the to the prologue, because I feel like the prologue does give us that perspective on here's the young and up and coming ranger of the Night's Watch with his with his nice sword and his nice cloak and all that, and then you have the sort of old grizzled guy who's been on the watch for years, and yeah, I mean, I don't know. In the prologue, the guy who's been on the watch for years ends up just like like fleeing, like he's like a coward mm. and just runs away, and then it's Waymar Royce who ends up sort of standing against the others. Doing the right thing. Waymar Royce is a true hero of A Song of Ice and Fire. Waymar Royce, all the way, Mar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Waymar Royce, an unsung hero. But to circle back to that, um, Bowen's seniority gives him the ability to do what he's doing to John to pester him with his idea. I think we also have to look at what Bowen is saying to John. What's his idea exactly, and why is John rejecting it? Bowen's idea is they don't get reinforcements. They don't get more they don't get more gold. They don't get help from anybody. They just keep doing what they're doing. The Night's Watch almost just fell in the in the battle for the wall. If Stannis doesn't show up, this plan is not going to work. We just saw it's not going to work. The Wildlings are getting through. And Bowen's plan is, yeah, we'll just keep doing this. I'm sh- I mean, Stannis saved us. We'll still be fine. And John is taking the opinion of, no, this is not fine. We need to do something big. If we're going to save the wall in the Night's Watch. And Bowen just flatly disagrees. He just wants to stand on the wall and wait for death to come. And you can't, you can't blame John for rejecting an idea that poor. 
No, and I totally agree. I think Bowen is coming and he's nitpicking parts of John's plan. And it's like, yes, John's plan does have risks. The wildlings could join the Night's Watch and then another wildling attack could happen and they could, you know, turn on the Night's Watch and stab them in the back. That could happen. Mm. But but if you leave them all on the other side of the wall, now they're all adversaries. Yes, they're all coming through. How is that any better? And Bowen Marsh doesn't ever offer any alternatives that would solve that problem that he's bringing up with John's plan. He's he's like ideologically against the wildlings simply because they're wildlings and because of his experience without thinking about mm. the context. In the context of the page that um, Matt brought up where Bowen Marsh is talking for like a long time about his ideas, in this moment, John admits that Bowen Marsh isn't wrong. And it's not just about not having the wildlings. It's a matter of also safety of We need to stop continuing to let the wildlings in so that we can seal the gate and bolster our defenses. He's saying that if our gate had been closed, uh, Donald Noy would not have had to hold it and we would have still had our armor with us. And then John thinks himself, he's not wrong. Mance Raider's host had broken against the wall like a wave upon a stony shore, Mm -hmm. though the defenders were no more than a handful of old men, green boys and cripples. And then what he says, though, is the reason he disagrees with Bowen is that what Bowen was suggesting went against all of John's instincts. He's not taking into consideration Bowen's logic behind it, which is that we need to bolster our defenses and close the gate, which is why we cannot continue to let the wildlings in. And John's not necessarily paying homage to that. He's just saying, if we seal the gates, we can't send out the rangers, which, yes, it's true. But if the point is, don't have people on the other side of the wall, why are we sending out rangers, too? I Mm. think then he also follows that up with, but this isn't the only gate. Like, there's other ways for wildlings to get through. They Mm. can climb over the wall, John knows, because he did it. There's, like, the the Bridge of Skulls, is that what it's called? Because they keep mentioning that's that's where Bowen Marsh got his scar on his face from fighting at the Bridge Mm -hmm. of Skulls. It's like, the wildlings can get in... If you lock them all immediately on the other side of the wall, they're running for their lives. They're going to continue to try to get in. Like one gate isn't going to stop them. If we let them through, we can at least control some of it and mitigate the disaster that's going to happen. And actually, uh, Dywin, the oldest Night's Watch ranger, talks about this specifically. Uh, This is a quote from A Dance of Dragons. He says, Seal our gates and plant your black, your fat black arses on the wall, I, and the free folk will come swarming over the bridge of skulls or through some gate you thought you'd seal 500 years ago. We don't have the men to watch a hundred leagues of wall. Tormund giant's butt and the bloody weeper knows it too. Ever see a duck frozen in a pond with his feet in the ice? It works the same for crows. Wait, you called him He's Tormund right. giant's butt? Yes. He did call him Tormund giant's butt. That's pretty butt. awesome. Dywin's feisty feisty well his butt is not the part of him that's giant all of him is giant all of him Mm. okay i wonder if there's not a good comparison to be made here to uh to danny in marine with in terms of making conciliations to people that you don't think you should make conciliations to danny and john are both being challenged by whether it's resnack or bowen marsh people who want to sort of go back to an old way of doing things and are resistant mm. to the radical change they're bringing. And I would say Danny succeeds where John fails in the sense that Danny is willing to compromise on her on her playing field to bring sort of a greater peace. Mm. Although she also does end up compromising with slavers as a which is a completely different moral question. I think yeah. there's an interesting comparison That's made there point. in terms of their leadership styles and who really is successful in the end. However, if you look at who they're dealing with Danny is being offered something in return. She's being offered um, peace in the city from his dar and the green grace. Mm. They'll give her the, the supplies she needs so that she can keep going. Bowen throughout this, throughout a dance with dragons is essentially offering John not to kill him because <laughs> his, his language is getting more and more and more aggressive as you go through uh, the chapters. Yeah. And at a certain point he is outright threatening John to his face there's a difference in the compromises that are being made. John can't go like halfway with letting the wildlings through. 5,000 whites is still not great. Yeah. He, he, yeah. You kind of have to go one way or the other on this, whereas Danny can decide who she marries. That's a more nuanced decision. <laughs> well, the difference in those situations is that the question is 
Will John listen to his men and make their appeals feel heard in order to maintain that status quo in which his people aren't necessarily dying? Whereas with Danny, what's being offered is not that she gets something in return. It's that we stop killing your people, we stop killing your men, and we give your city peace. Danny's already at a negative. She's trying to get to like a baseline, and she achieves that goal. Whereas for John, hmm. Hmm. it's not the same. Hmm. You may have swayed me. <laughs> That's not how we do this, <laughs> is it? Sorry, I mean, I disagree. I disagree. <laughs> but just about the Danny point, right? Just about the Danny point. Just about the yeah. Dan- yeah, right. Okay, sure. okay. Fair. Okay. Fair. Yeah, and I mean, like, as Michael was saying, they're different moral questions, but they are still, to an extent, the argument being made is that the wildlings are also human and thus deserve to be put on this side of the wall, also for the, like, greater good of let's not mm-hmm. uh, increase the other's army. Whereas for Danny, the moral question is, as we have, like, agreed upon in this day and age, <laughs> slavery is wrong. Right. To take yeah. away the freedom of someone else is wrong, but she makes concessions that aren't necessarily slavery, but continue a tradition that was built on it. Yeah, right, right. It, it's. I don't know if that actually has anything to do with this argument, so maybe... I, don't know. <laughs> I agree with you. We might be able to cut it, but I agree with you. Um, I will say, too, so uh, about the wildlings coming, you know, coming south of the wall, I think one of the places where John sort of failed here... And it's not as much to do with Bowen Marsh, although it's involved, is not coalition building with the lords in the north, not, you know, sort of giving them a heads up, not organizing a way to get the wildlings south. Because as it is, like, what are the Umbers going to do when the Night's Watch says, ah, we're not going to do our job anymore. Like, here's a bunch of wildlings for you. Deal with it. And there's no there's no coordination. There's no infrastructure. And again, I feel like it comes back to John not wanting to personally deal with the Boltons and not wanting to be involved in the politics of the north for his own bastardy reasons. I think John has an explanation for that in that the the land he's going to give them to settle, assuming they stay there, is doesn't belong to any lord. It belongs to the Night's Watch, right? Yeah, but the, de facto. The gift has been emptied, and the new gift has been emptied too because of the wildlings. They've all ran south, so that's all empty for them to stay on. I think that's his explanation, but he that's not I great. think you're right, the though. Flints, yeah. The Flints and the Norries did put up uh, an objection to letting even more wildlings through. Ah, there we go. Because they said, they asked John, like, who are you going to stop them when they come down and raid our lands and steal our women? I mean, yeah, he's, he's not he's not giving them, like, umber land and all that. He's settling them on Night's Watch land, which is, is kind of a smart idea. But at the, he's got the, at the same time, you know, they're, they're next door neighbors to the, uh, to the people who they've been, you know, raping and killing for, for millennia. There's got to be some sort of better PR move. But the others. But the others are worse. Yeah. The others. But they haven't like seen the others. They like a lo- even the North doesn't necessarily believe that they exist. I think though that this whole thing, like what you're saying about the Northern clans and John not treating with them and the consequences of that, I think this is one of those elements that was hurt by the scrapping of the five year gap uh. because I think that. We would have seen more of those politics play out and the consequences of John letting those wildlings in after like five years of him trying to resettle the gift with the wildlings. And then they have tensions with the northern clans and other northern houses. And then along with creating chaos there and all the other things that happen, everyone's like, John, you've done a terrible job. (laughs) That's a re- that's a really interesting idea. I never thought of that as the five year gap covering the uh, like the repopulation of the the, the new gift. Um, hmm. It would have been cool to see. I mean, we got that with the the Magnar of Then and uh, Alice Carstark, their marriage. It would have been cool to see things like that and things not like that, like you know, North and Wildlings fighting happening a little bit more, or at least talked about in a backstory or something. That'd be cool. John gets the letter from Ramsay. They're in the mm-hmm. feast hall. Yeah. And he opens it up and he reads it out loud, which is probably a mistake. <laughs> Tormund is like, hey, bro, let's go save your sister. Right? Yeah. And John's like, heck yeah, let's go take a wildling <laughs> army and save my sister. And he's been waffling back and forth on this. It's like he's thinking about Arya and then immediately saying, no, like, I have no sister. I'm a part of the Night's Watch now. I can't do anything about it. No. 
And I'm not I'm not sure what makes him change his mind right at that minute. I mean, he can justify it by saying that Ramsey was threatening to watch. I still think that's not a valid argument. But my question is, Bowen Marsh. Yeah. Was Bowen Marsh already planning mm. on stabbing John at yeah. that point? It couldn't have been. I mean, like, how many people stabbed John? Several, right? At least, like, five, six. They hold their knives already, yeah. They, they, they would, it couldn't have just been, like, Bowen Marsh turned around and was like, Hey guys, this is one step too far. Let's let's why don't why don't we just go stab our Lord Commander? Mm. Right? I mean I I feel like that had to have been planned. Interesting. And at what point did Bowen Marsh decide that they needed to kill John? Uh going back to what I said in the beginning, I think it's as soon as Jan Slint's head came off. Him and, and Bowen Marsh were fast friends. They they were moving up the watch together. John kills Janos and Bowen is devastated by it almost. I think at that moment, and especially actually this is an underplayed part of Bowen. Mm-hmm. He probably has PTSD from his uh from the Bridge of Skulls, and he definitely took a head wound to it. Oh. So he's been he's been different ever since he came back from that, like significantly different. So he may not be in a right frame of mind, but it seems pretty clear from the way Bowen's not changing his mind about anything John is saying, not listening to him arguing constantly that he's got it out for John pr- probably yeah since Janos died interesting maybe not deliberately like not maybe not deliberately like I'm definitely gonna kill him but it's on his mind he wants John mm. not to be in charge that's I, and I, don't, I could agree to that yeah go ahead no I, was, I, I don't think it was that early yeah mm. I I think it was when it was right after he let Tormund through the wall and he tells his he tells certain men to meet him on top of the wall at sunset, and it's Bowen Marsh and Leathers, and uh, like a Flint and a Nori and someone else. Mm. Yeah. And he's telling them about how he let Tormund through, and he's telling them that he's sending the ships to get the wildlings from, from Hardhome. Hardhome. Yeah. Mm. And he's telling them that when what's the the wildling other wildling chief. The howler or something the, the weeper the, the weeping man weeper we- the, the weeper <laughs> yeah. he's te- he's telling them that when the weeper comes that they have to give him the same deal that they've given torment and the other wildlings and bowen marsh is like he's a murderer he's a rapist we literally cannot let this guy through the wall and john's like oh no if he takes the black he'll be a brother just like the rest of us and it's like I think that's the point at which Bowen was like, this is this is just too much. Because, you know, Tormund is an enemy. Mance is an enemy. They may be traitors, whatnot, but they're essentially honorable people. Right, sure. Right. And now you're talking about letting this complete barbarian through. Yeah. And I don't. I think that's the point at which he decided something had to be done. That's a really good reading of that, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I feel like even if... I, I, like, I like what Matt's saying about... Bowen sort of right from the get go being having in his mind like gosh I just really wish Jon Snow wasn't my boss but that being like the turning point where he's like okay it's time to round up the round up the old posse <laughs> and uh, drive Matt to town hmm. I like that do you think they call him the Gwim Weeper by the way um, yes that, yeah yes sure. the wildling yes. chief Definitely. yeah he's the Gwim Weeper yes okay yes mm-hmm. great. <laughs> Um, yeah, to Waldo's point, um, you know, I never thought about that meeting in that context, but I think you're right that it was premeditated, especially like if you think about, um, the connections between John stabbing and how it really parallels the stabbing in Julius Caesar, um, both the play and in real life. (laughs) And, you know, that wasn't, obviously they planned that if John's, Uh, death is meant to parallel that then it must have been premeditated but i do think that when they did it they legitimately thought that they were doing the right thing and doing it for the watch as they say and they even do it with tears in their eyes yeah Mm. are they also weeping are they weepers whoa (laughs) oh my god bonin is weeping (laughs) bowen (laughs) weepo gwim gwim bowen gwim John is brought down by the Weeper. <laughs> oh my god, it's true. Foreshadowing. <laughs> that's actually interesting, though. Like, for real. <laughs> the Weeper. That's, act- that's actually pretty good. That's a good catch. Post. That's a hashtag. Wait. wait. Nice. For, regarding the Weeping? Catch. 
Yeah, I mean, the tears in their eyes and, you know, the make, making a big deal about the Weeper as a villain, which, let's be real, if you if you stand, like, pretend you've never read A Song of Ice and Fire and someone is like, okay, in book five, there's this guy and he doesn't appear on screen very much and he's a super villain and his name is the Weeper and he cuts people's eyes out. <laughs> You'd be like, come on, that's that's some comic book stuff. That's pretty dumb. So I feel like the Weeper, like, like that could be, that's something George R. Martin threw in there and then found a way to make it make it tie into other things <laughs> would saying. you say it's some wild card stuff oh, oh got him and then would you, you say he's subverting the trope subvert the trope and then you have that song where it's like seasons don't fear the weeper <laughs> and we're all about seasons the long oh winter my God. <laughs> okay we did oh it oh my gosh so how did we come um, from unpopular opinion thunderdome about did john sort of deserve to die to making puns on the weeper that that's kind of a welcome to thunderdome welcome to the thunderdome <laughs> thunderdome <laughs> there's so much violence and anger that we end up doing puns so we all i think we all at the end of this thunderdome had a few a few wrong opinions that were rightly corrected uh some of us remain wrong and will remain wrong for eternity um you know no one escapes the thunderdome unscathed Everyone ended up with more than a few daggers in their back. Am I right, guys? Am I right? Am I right? Play me out, Sam. For our special Women's Month episode, uh, Matt and I are appropriately going to duck out here and pass the microphones over to a couple of the other moderators. Um, So that's it for me, Bookshelf Stud, a.k.a. Michael. I will see you guys on the flippity flop and i've been <laughs> joe magician aka matt we're gonna go inform the patriarchy of the vile things happening <laughs> speaking of weeping and how women are such fucking cry babies let's talk about the women of westeros <laughs> This month's rotating topic, in honor of March, which was Women's History Month, we wanted to do a segment that focuses on the women of Planetos, Teros, whatever you call it, Os, and how a swath approaches them. So joining us today are a bunch of our female mods, um, and I'm going to give them a chance to introduce themselves. I'm Jen, again. <laughs> Hi, I'm Isabel. Glad to be here. And I am Fat Walda, also back. So we wanted to kick off today's cast with a great post from 27 days ago by a user called user n5 and user n5 asks a question about your thoughts on the role slash attitudes towards both men and women in a swath asking about examples of traditional male slash female characters and how these characters use their gender or how they represent them so regarding how george r R. martin presents his world and the role of women in it what do you think about how we see these different archetypes of women like especially with the ones who take more of a foreground role. I definitely feel like Martin has molds that he makes his characters from. And I haven't thought as much about the male characters, but in terms of the female characters, there are characters who have very similar characteristics and attitudes towards their situation and the world they're in. Um, But then I find that also there are some characters who are maybe have more than one archetype. Um, right? Or if you're thinking about it in terms of the seven, they have more than one aspect, right? They're not just the maiden or they're not just the mother. They're maybe the mother and the father or the mother and the whatnot. I wrote an essay about that that I found. Apparently, I wrote it in November of 2015. um, And I found it on my computer and I'm going to clean it up and publish it soon. And it's about how Catalan is not only an aspect of the mother, she's also an aspect of the father, um, more so than, say, the stranger when she takes on her Lady Stoneheart persona. I mean, think about like Brienne. Brienne is like the warrior, but she's also like the maiden, right? These archetypes are not just necessarily prevalent in the story. When I think of archetypes, I think of them as like, what do we recognize as going through literature? Like when we think of Brienne as the warrior, also, we also get a bunch of other corollaries. We end up with a lot of other associations of what it means to be a warrior woman in a fantasy world, a fantasy novel. A segue to that, because this talk reminds me, there was this Neil Gaiman blog post um, a while ago, and it was just a short one where it was like medieval European girls and fiction versus history. Hmm. And in fiction, it's, I hate sewing. It's so pointless and lame. My sisters and my mom are so stupid. I'm smart. I'm going to go ride my pony and learn how to use a sword. Brar, I'm fierce. Remind <laughs> you of some people. <laughs> hmm. history. I've never heard that before. <laughs> 
women in history is, without my needle, you would all be naked and dead. Excuse me, I have to go through a party and negotiate a land deal. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like it does, like, for the fiction, it does remind you of some certain warrior women in A Song of Ice and Fire in Westeros. <laughs> we do get to see both kinds of women doing their work in A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, maybe not at proportions that are consistent with the historical record, but... We get to see uh, Cersei putting on her best clothes and being queen of Westeros. And we also get to see Arya and Brienne running around with swords and being fierce in the warrior way. We get to see Marjorie climbing the ladder by throwing parties. You got Catelyn treating with the phrase. And Stannis and Renly. Yeah, exactly. She's the one who's brokering... Stannis and Renly, I don't know that any, any power of Catelyn's could have overcome the power of bad blood... Right, but the point is, is that out of all the people that Rob had near him, Cat was the one who got chosen to go and treat with them, two men who are claiming to be kings. She has that social stature that is high enough. And she's respected. And she knows her stuff. Yeah. And she knocks their heads together like they're unruly brothers. In the early part of the chapter that ends up with Tyrion being abducted, right, at the end, the, the whole first part of that chapter is Catelyn walking through basically everything she knows about Riverland's politics and her memories of growing up in River Run and why that's why she knows these things is because she knows these people. And it all is ground for her being a good choice to go do diplomacy for the king in the north come book two. She's able to read situations because she's been doing it all her life. To skip over all of that and hang on Catelyn, what happens at the end of the chapter as like the mistake is to miss all of the information that we're getting at the beginning of the chapter that helps us understand who she is in this world and why she's successful in this world. I feel like we see in terms of the the two archetypes that Jen brought up, we see like the girls working on their needlework And we see the boys learning their heraldry. And yet Catelyn is displaying this knowledge of heraldry and families and diplomacy, not the knowledge of needlework. Hmm. So it's interesting, like, where did she get that? If the girls learn needlework, then I think that she implies that she got a lot of it from her father, who was willing to share with her what was going on in the Riverlands as he was dealing with the lords and she was growing up. It's interesting that she got that given that she does have a brother who would be the one ostensibly to inherit that political role. I think the great ladies of Westeros are responsible for organizing good marriages. And you have to know all that heraldry stuff and all those that history stuff to be able to get those matches made. Right. And I'm thinking about Joanna Lannister and I'm thinking about the work that Catelyn is doing as Sansa is coming of age. As evidence for, you know, these are specific making the matches that are going to keep the body politic functioning. We see Elena Terrell doing this and that's their work and knowing the heraldry and knowing the family histories and being able to figure out, well, this this teenager and this teenager are going to be able to partner up and run a household together. I think that's some of the work that the women of Westeros are expected to do. So you're saying that women politically are getting the negotiating and the peaceful side of it right the marriage yeah and the not even just the marriage just the political brokering the building of alliance if your alliance is also kind of built on how much do i actually like this person and you see that in a game of thrones in one of those early sansa chapters where they're like hey sansa pop quiz who are all of these people and she's like um well based on your youth and your antler things. I name you Renly Baratheon. And she's yeah. able to name all these different people having never met her, them in her life, but being able to recognize who someone is, their station, and what you might potentially be able to do with them is an, it seems like there's an establishment that that's an important part of being a lady in Westeros. Especially with Sans after she married Tyrion. Tyrion also pointed it out. Sansa's really, really good at going into a room and knowing exactly what to do to basically get out of that room alive. She had only herself, like, what she knew about the royal families in Westeros to navigate the whole political spectrum of, like, the Lannisters going against, like, Baratheons and, like, all of that and just survive. And the fact that she could Mm -hmm. do that 
if she didn't have the knowledge of the houses and like make yourself be seen as how they want to see you, she would not have survived at all. The armor of her courtesy. That's her protection. And that's why Sansa does have that defense. Arya would not perform that well in the same situation. Does Arya have that awareness of what people around her are thinking, what station they are, what they expect her to do? I mean, she's so defiant. She doesn't want to do what people want her to do, right? She wants to to fight them. You know, the idea that Arya is stronger than Sansa, it, it's very contextual mm -hmm. because in the situation that Sansa is in, she is doing what she needs to do to survive. And the situation that Arya is in, she's choosing a sort of different path. I'm not sure how much courtesy would help her. In, in your head canon, do you credit Septa Mordain or do you credit Catelyn for what Sansa is good at doing? I would credit Septa Mordain on the rote memorization of the learn this thing, learn this thing, learn this thing, history, etc. What one expects of a governess-esque person. But perhaps it seems as though maybe she would learn from Catelyn all the other duties of how do I act in public because then Catelyn is her model for all that. Not that we ever see it. <laughs> so yeah, further like about Arya, you know, like who are her mentors? I know earlier in today's podcast, we talked about like who are some of the models and idols that Jon Snow sees, but a lot of people, Arya Stark's story is one where she has so many different people teaching her and so many different mentors Um starting with Winterfell. Who are the kinds of people that she would look to and what does she learn? She has her brothers, obviously. I guess she's the wild child. Like, she wants to be with her brothers, play with her brothers, like, show off to her brothers and be better than her brothers. She definitely calls back to her training with Sirio, even though it was short. She uses his words um, as inspiration a lot when she's afraid, when she's fighting. I feel like she recalls her father quite often, but I don't necessarily think that she acts in a way that her father would find um, acceptable or appropriate. So I'm not sure it's fair to call him a mentor when Ned Stark is all about honor and she's going down the path of the assassin. <laughs> I feel like in all of these examples that you've given are male characters. Yeah. Yeah, Martin cuts her off from any women that she might find as a mentor. She gets to the House of Black and White and she has the Waif and the Waif is an adversary, not a mentor. In the book, I feel like she's less of an adversary. She's She doesn't like hit her. She's just like, make faces at me. The kindly man tells her, do what the Waif does. She's at least 30 years old. But looks like a six-year-old. <laughs> Whoa, it's like an anime. Okay, let's check that out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it happens all the time in anime. <laughs> yeah. She's the Chibiusa. Thinking about whether Arya has female mentors, but what about Brienne or... Hmm. Asha interacts with no yeah. women at all. I mean, like, there's... We meet, like, one other Ironborn woman, and it's her mom. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. There aren't any other Ironborn women... Uh, we meet uh, Theon's woman that he's no. the ship. having sex with. The is she ship. Ironborn? <laughs> she's not Ironborn, is she? No. She's the captain's oh, yeah. daughter. Yeah. Yeah, she's just some random girl. I mean, like, so Asha, she's even in a society where it's a little bit more acceptable for her to be that martial and that demanding of leadership and responsibility. She has a crew. Her crew is all men. There are no other women in the Ironborn community that we see that step up, and not even historically, right? I mean, they don't, they don't have, like, a legend of a queen or a woman who was a warrior. It's like at least Arya has Nymeria and some other historical figures to look back at. I mean, Arya even has her sister. I mean, not sister, Aunt Lyanna. Right. Asha is just like, hey, I'm going to do this because I'm the king's daughter and I can. Asha is kind of a smurfette yeah it's the storytelling trope where th there's a whole bunch of men doing stuff and there's also a character who's female and the thing that she does is being female like smurfette is in or miss piggy smurfette's thing is to be female at least asha's like competent yes <laughs> yes she... in her society oh mm. oh so she's deconstructing she's deconstructing the smurfette in print principle by actually being competent at being uh. at being a viking pirate okay i like it smurfette miss piggy they're very feminine yeah that is their character their character is being feminine yes whereas asha is like clearly a woman and she seems to enjoy being a woman 
but she just thinks that women should have more power or it, maybe not even women she thinks she should have more power <laughs> yeah hmm that's interesting yeah i don't know yeah. how much of a broad feminist she is she just thinks that she is capable of being the leader of the ironborn not necessarily that all ironborn women should be out on ships and and she's like cersei in that way that cersei thinks she should have more yeah. power but cersei is i should have more power because i'm beautiful and i have the best dresses <laughs> because jamie has it so i should have it too <laughs> and that right and also, he looks just like me, and he's the best sort. Whereas Asha's like, I should be queen because I'm actually really better at all of this than you guys are. There are the women who want to retain their identity as women, but also have power. And then there are the women who sort of reject their identity and role as women in the society. Arya and Brienne as being the kind of women who don't care to be women. Ned tells Arya that someday she's going to get married and she'll have her own castle and her own children. And Arya, albeit she's what, eight or nine, she's like, I don't want that. That's not something I'm interested in at all. And she might change her mind. She might not. Brienne obviously wanted to get married. Is that because she wanted to fit into the society or is that because it was something she really wanted to do? Whereas you have Asha, who enjoys being a woman. You have Cersei, who seems to enjoy being a woman. She just doesn't like to be limited because she's a woman. And then you have people like Arian, who definitely enjoy being a woman. And yet feel like, probably because she has grown up in this Dornish society that says that women can be rulers in their own right, she is free to be feminine and seek power. I think that there's a huge parallel in the series between... Ariane and Cersei, that you have two women who are feminine. They are being proposed for matches that will be very political. They are very high ranked women in terms of political marriages, but that they both want power in their own right. And I think maybe if Cersei had grown up in a society like Dorne, where you have women who are able to hold power in their own right. You have women who are martially training, like the Sand Snakes, um, that maybe she would have been a little bit happier and a little less pathological because she could have had an outlet for that. I wonder if Cersei was denied or neglected in the education that we were talking about 20 minutes ago about Sansa getting, right? The, the heraldry and the politics and the history and the family. Cersei doesn't seem to have a working knowledge of that stuff in face for crows she's judging people around her on whether or not they say things she wants to hear or not but she's not bringing any of that historical background to it it seems to maybe be symptomatic of her losing her mother if she lost her mother at a young age would tywin be the kind of father to think of that because tywin's the kind of guy who's like no that's a woman's world it's not my problem like he never yeah thought that hey maybe you know this is something that she needs to learn in order to survive as a woman and accept the fact that she is a woman do you think in the real world like the queens and real world like queen elizabeth ii like even though she wasn't expected to take the throne like she was really really well educated like even though her mother mm -hmm. had died because her dad beheaded her mom Wait, are you talking about Elizabeth I or Elizabeth II? <laughs> yeah, Elizabeth I. <the> <laughs> I was going to say, was someone beheaded? <laughs> the Queen Mother. Oh, to oh me. no. <laughs> Granted, I think it was the last wife from Henry VIII, uh, Catherine Parr, was one that was really into like making sure that both her and her sister got that education that they were missing out because of the whole like just having a new mom every two <laughs> years or yes. however long it was between. Mm. But um, yeah, Cersei, she didn't get that. Yeah, we can pretty much unequivocally say that Cersei is a train wreck of a queen. But there's more to it than that. There's the distrust, even though Arianne is in a society where she is supposed to, from the time she was born, being the oldest child, they knew that she was going to be the ruler. It's not like some brothers had to die in order for her to become the princess of Dorne. She is still very distrustful of her father. She thinks that he's trying some kind of plot to get her brother on the throne instead of her. She comes up with her own scheme in order to seize that power back. And it is also an unmitigated failure. She surrounds herself with these people who may or may not be loyal to her. She comes up with these plots that are sort of half-baked. And it's very similar to what Cersei is grappling with in King's Landing, not 
really being in control of her situation. Granted, if I were Arianne and I saw a letter on my father's desk that was like, yeah, I'm gonna make you son Quentin, the Lord of Dorne. I'd be like, yo, father, what, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> this is mine. So I don't like, don't necessarily blame her. And to contrast like Arianne and Cersei and also bringing it back to things we were talking about regarding Sansa and who's teaching her how to build alliances. Arianne, while some of the loyalties that she has are suspect, like some of the people who are loyal to her, you do have that she has that close relationship with her female cousins, the Sand Snakes, and she knows that they're going to throw in with her. She has that sort of female companionship that she can rely on that Cersei doesn't. And I'm starting to wonder if, as Isabel was pointing out, um, if maybe it is some something that does get passed down from the mother to the daughter, because we saw that Joanna Lannister did have a retinue of ladies around her. She had Elia Martell amongst some of her friends and was brokering those marriage alliances, which Tywin's like, no, <laughs> that's it. No. Very good Tywin impression. You know who else is really good at the history and dynastic politics and heraldry and, and figuring out the matches is Littlefinger. Littlefinger is doing women's work mm. as he works his way up the veil. Mm-hmm. He That's is. interesting. Yeah. Poisoning mm-hmm. and yeah. all that kind of stuff. He's yeah. not bragging about it because it's sketchy stuff. But from Sansa's point of view, it's obvious I don't know if Sansa knows. I don't know if that's Sansa's analysis, but she knows he's yeah. poisoning. She knows that he's brokering these these marriages. And a lot of the perspective that we're given or shown in these books, which is like George R. R. Martin's like constructed world. This isn't the real world, but in his world, the opportunities that are available to those lowborn women is that they can maybe take a shot at having an inn or being a brewer or they become prostitutes. The only other perspective we get is Shay or like Chitaya, Aleaya are prostitutes or they own brothels. He's a brothel owner. Yeah. Just something that women tend to do. I don't know what I think about what Martin thinks about a man doing woman's work. We get a lot about women doing men's work, but not. Huh. I don't want the story to be the thing that's wrong with Littlefinger is that he's doing women's work. I want the story to be that it is a sign of what Littlefinger is willing to do to get what he wants. That he's willing to buck the gender mm-hmm. role and I and wonder, do what he, yeah. and do what or he's good maybe at. That's I wonder if it's a sign of like he basically is just using the tools at his disposal that he needs mm-hmm. because he didn't come from that royal family. He didn't come from a wealthy area. He's literally crawling his way up using whatever he can get his hands on. Yeah. And one of those ways is by knowing exactly what the political spectrum is and what's happening. Yeah. And exploiting the chinks in the armor, right? Men are not going to protect themselves in that way from other men. Because they won't expect it. Some of the people he's... I guess all the people he's poisoned are men, huh? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he always does it through still a woman, but he's the originator. And in some ways, like, women kind of... They don't see it coming either because they don't think to look at him because he's not the traditional source of that kind of thing. Sansa is working closely with him and she sees it. She might not know she sees it, but she's seeing it. (laughs) Yeah. So we have Cersei cut off from a traditional women's education, potentially, and becoming a psychopath. And we have Littlefinger getting gender bullied by Brandon and ending up the psychopath road. I do think that Martin is saying something about the rigidity of gender roles, the damage that can do. Because there's always going to be people who aren't going to conform. And we see with Littlefinger and Cersei how bad it can be. And we're seeing with Brienne and with Arya and Asha and Ariane, like the potential to be able to break out of that and create something new. Littlefinger being in a woman's world discussion and how he's like, the only male character kind of taking on that role. The other male character that we can say is taking on that role is probably Varys, yeah. and he's a yeah. eunuch. Uh, agreed. Yeah. And they're opposites. They're across the Sivas board from each other. Yes. Everybody else is just pawns in their game. Varys goes between both genderless is how they like depict him. And because of that, 
As opposed to Littlefinger, and George R. R. Martin has said that people like Littlefinger, Varys is viewed with suspicion because people outwardly see him as encompassing that feminine role. Whereas with Littlefinger, it's not as obvious until you examine it from the reader's point of view and see the sort of things that he's doing. The people who are gender benders are going to rule the world at the end of the books. That's where we're going. Should we talk about Danny? We were talking about archetypes at the very top of the conversation. I would argue that Danny is all the archetypes. Mm, She's yes. like Whitney Houston's, I'm yes. every woman, it's all in. Jen's dancing too. You guys can't tell, but Jen's <laughs> dancing too, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> she, is, she is all the archetypes. She, she is all the seven. Female mentors for Danny. We talked about female mentors like for Asha or lack mm, of. Yeah. And lack of for Cersei. And yeah, Danny, what female mentors does she have? Well, she has Mary Mazdur and she burns her to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> That's a healthy relationship. No. <laughs> she has this real relationship though, right? Her mentors are people who are in the social structure. They're beneath her. Like, because she's at the top, you know, her handmaidens are the ones who teach her. They're like, this is how you live in Dothraki society. This is how you, I guess, have sex. And then later on, she goes to the Green Grace. She's conquered these people. And she's, the Green Grace is like, this is how you do things here. This is how you're going to make people listen to you. Is Miss Sande a, a uh, mentor to Danny? Um, I She's got such a different role yeah. in the show yeah. as she does in the books. Yeah. In the book, she's like a page, right? She's a she's an assistant. She's... Yeah. She's Podrick. Yeah. Right. And in the show... She's like a female companion, yeah. right? Which is not a bad change. Yeah. Danny is surrounded by other power women in, in positions of power to an extent. Like, you know, along with the Green Grace, she also encounters people such as she encounter, encounters the Dosh Colleen. And while they don't necessarily guide her, they are to an extent some sort of model of perhaps what a leading woman in a society ought to be like and the, and the show has done the dash Colleen no favors but yeah. yeah and i mean to danny's credit with the exception of i guess everyone being below her i don't think she has that many mentors in general regardless of gender well and she's in that situation where she grew up watching her brother being the beggar king and being either turned down or exploited by the people around him and so she has a high level of distrust be able to to take somebody as a mentor, you have to have some reason to trust them. Yeah. I mean, the person she first took as a mentor, or like not first took, but like probably came closest is Jora, and Jora broke that trust. So then we're left with like, who's she going to trust then? Barristan. Barristan. But even Bears, he has to fight to get that trust. Yeah. And he's not, he's not going to be a mentor as like, how do you be a queen? Barristan's not helpful for that. No. So I feel like what we're seeing is is that we have these female point of view characters and we have some variation in the archetypes that these female POV characters embody, but we don't see mm -hmm. enough interaction yeah. mm -hmm. between women in Westeros. We see women interacting with male society. Yeah, that's a great point about like we don't necessarily see women interacting with each other, especially like... You know, as we were talking about before, like, who serves as these mentor figures? There was this great post um, two months ago call about the lack of mother-daughter relationships and how we see a lot of relationships between fathers and sons or even between, like, how Ned acts towards Arya or Sansa or even, like, Dorian and Arianne or Balin and Asha, Hoster and Catelyn, Tywin and Cersei. But we don't get enough idea of what a woman's world, woman's role is necessarily in Westeros um, because of the lack of some of these mother-daughter relationships. You don't get that knowledge passed between the two. Some of that comes from the decision to have so many protagonists have lost their mothers. So there aren't, as, there aren't enough mothers around. But then there's Catelyn. Yeah. That's what I was going to say, is that Catelyn is really the only mother- there are other mothers in the series. We see Cersei. We don't see Marcella fleshed out as a character enough to know about their relationship. We see Danny as a mother. She's a mother to dragons. There's not much potential there for mother daughter. You know, it's kind of mother <laughs> reptile relationship. Um, you 
have like Elena just out of your grasp. You can just yeah. almost see how she would teach someone with Marjorie, but it's just a little out of reach. Well, and we and we get the scene with Marjorie and Elena and Sansa. Like that's Mhm. It's great. It's yeah. a great scene. More, more like that. You got music, mm-hmm. you've got cheese, you got comedy yeah. and drama. Mm-hmm. You've got Elena kind of playing the political, this is how we do it. Yeah. <laughs> Surrounded by a retinue of women because yep. they're building alliances with all their lower houses. If only Sansa was able to marry Wylas and move to Highgarden. Yes. What could have been? Yeah. All the lemon cakes. And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where's Brienne's mother? She's uh, dead. Yeah. Dead. Yeah. As one does. And uh, Kat's mother, dead. Cersei's mother, dead. Danny's mother, dead. It's like a Disney movie. Yeah. <laughs> Every Disney movie ever. They're dead. <laughs> They're not convenient to the story anymore. They died. I mean, like, yeah, the whole the whole thing about asking Gurm who Ned's mother yeah. was, right? Like, Ned's mother doesn't, she doesn't get a personality or anything. A name. She doesn't get a name. Actually, she does, but her, it was very non-defined. So to make this world building work, people are cut off from each other. And people are cut off from their communities, and especially women are cut off from their professional communities, their political communities, where where that education doesn't happen, and where those skills are only intermittently passed on. You get a war of the five kings that is, is as catastrophic as it is. It breeds instability. Yes. Yeah, and that's a great point that like brings it out to like the larger world that we are seeing play out in the rest of this story. And trying to understand, like, what the ramifications are on the instability in Westeros. For sure. All right. How does everyone feel about that being the note on which we end? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a good note to end. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All right. And just let me put a plug in for our sister sub, the Accursed Kings. Um, We're working through the Accursed Kings series, which is a series about French medieval period Iron King. Um, and it is, Gurm has pointed it out as one of the inspirations for the Song of Ice and Fire series. And of course, that series has a lot of female POVs, written um, actual female characters who were doing things in that time period. And they have a lot more, I'm going to say it, agency than some of the women in Aswa. It's a really good series. Y'all should come over and check it out, and it's not too late to get caught up. Yeah, I need to I need to get on that train. Yeah, I need you to get on that train too. <laughs> and with that, that's our Women of Whatever Os episode. And I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you so much to our guests. I've been Glass Table Girl, aka Eliana. I'm Mighty Isabel. I'm Bassmaster Jen. <laughs> and I'm Fat Walda. And thanks to y'all for joining us. And thanks, of course, to the users for making this awesome content. We wouldn't have anything to draw from. We wouldn't have these celebrated highlights if it weren't for all of you making these great posts. And stay tuned for next month where we'll have more in store. (laughs) 